When stuff and services get more expensive, your dollars can buy less of them. That's called inflation. And it's a problem because investors want to fund future consumption. If stuff gets more expensive, you need to save more, spend less, or earn higher investment returns to meet your objectives. Starting in March 2020, central banks and governments had been trying their hardest to get inflation to increase. And as we all now know, it eventually worked. In some ways, believe it or not, this is a good thing. We avoided the dreaded deflationary spiral that policymakers wanted to avoid. On the other hand, high inflation comes with its own problems. A big question for investors is whether you should try to do anything tactical with your portfolio as a response to inflationary pressure. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. Today I'm going to tell you how to position your portfolio for times of high inflation. Inflation fears have led many investors to seek inflation hedges for their portfolios. Assets that tend to perform well when inflation is high, reducing its destructive effects on purchasing power. Ideally, an inflation hedge will protect unexpected inflation, won't be too volatile, and will have a positive real expected return. Unfortunately, this asset does not exist. But that doesn't mean we can't do anything. The goal of most investors is to fund future consumption, which can be difficult when prices are rising. Take the 17-year period from 1966 to 1982, one of the worst times in the U.S. stock market data to retire, largely due to inflation. The S&P 500 index returned a seemingly respectable 6.8% annualized before inflation for the full period, but after adjusting for inflation, a dollar invested in the index did not grow at all. Expected inflation is reflected in asset prices. The price of a financial asset is theoretically the present value of expected cash flows, where the discount rate describes the riskiness of the cash flows. We can decompose the discount rate into multiple components. For a stock, the discount rate decomposes into a real risk-free rate, expected inflation, a risk premium for the uncertainty about future inflation, and a risk premium for owning risky assets. The important point here is that both stocks and bonds have inflation expectations and an inflation risk premium built into their prices. So expected inflation is not really problematic for financial asset owners. The easiest way to observe an estimate of expected inflation from market prices is with the difference in yield between inflation protected and nominal government bonds. Comparing the yields gives us the market's best guess at future inflation over the horizon of the bond, plus a risk premium to compensate for the uncertainty about future inflation. For Canadian long-term bonds, the current break-even rate at the time of recording, April 24, 2022, is about 2%. In the U.S., the 10-year break-even rate based on U.S. Treasury securities is just under 3%. Unfortunately, break-even rates have been poor predictors of future realized inflation so we can't use them to time any portfolio management decisions. But they do give us an estimate of what the market is currently pricing in. Unexpected inflation benefits borrowers at the expense of lenders. If there's a lot of uncertainty about future inflation, lenders will demand a higher uncertainty premium on loans, increasing the cost of borrowing and potentially dampening economic activity. There's a deep body of academic literature on the relationship between asset prices and inflation. Papers by Fahman Schwartz in 1977, Fahman in 1981, and Budok and Richardson in 1993 formalize a negative relationship between stock prices and inflation. Dimson, Marsh, and Staunton document this relationship for 21 countries back to 1900, confirming that high realized inflation has generally put downward pressure on real stock returns, and long-term bonds have been impacted even more dramatically than stocks. Stocks are not an inflation hedge, but in inflation-adjusted terms, global stocks have returned an annualized 5.2% going back to 1900. High inflation can hurt in the short run, but over long periods of time, stock returns have tended to deliver a premium in excess of inflation. This is more a reflection of the equity risk premium rather than an inflation hedging capability. So it doesn't really help with periods like the aforementioned 1966 to 1982, where real U.S. stock returns were 0% for an extended period of time. The only true hedge against unexpected inflation is government inflation-protected securities like TIPS in the United States and real return bonds in Canada. These assets provide a government-backed boost in periods of high unexpected inflation by indexing their principal to maintain purchasing power. But they come at the cost of lower expected returns. Nominal bond yields have inflation uncertainty priced in, 
meaning that with increasing inflation uncertainty, nominal bond yields will be increasingly higher than inflation-protected bond yields, all else equal. The other issue with inflation-protected bonds is that they are only an obvious hedge against unexpected inflation if the bond perfectly matches your investment horizon. If it doesn't, there can be meaningful short-term price volatility in inflation-protected bonds that overwhelms their ability to protect you from inflation. This makes longer-dated inflation-protected bonds and bond funds an unlikely hedge against short-term unexpected inflation. Short-dated inflation-protected securities do get around the issue of bond price volatility, but they have even lower yields. It seems like cash would be the worst thing to hold during a period of high inflation, but that's only true for dollar bills sitting under your mattress. Short-term debt and cash earn interest. If central banks raise rates to combat inflation, as they often do, interest rates on short-term debt will tend to increase. Rising rates hurt the prices of longer maturity bonds badly, but short maturity fixed income, like one month treasury bills or even a high interest savings account, are stable in their day-to-day -day nominal value and they benefit a little bit from rising yields. In the 1966 to 1982 period where inflation ravaged stock returns, one month US treasury bills held their own, outpacing inflation by a narrow margin. Even over longer periods of time, bills, short-term government debt, have been able to at least keep pace with inflation in Canada, the US, and many other countries around the world. It is possible in some situations that short-term rates will not rise with inflation. So again, they're not a perfect hedge. And they have very low or even negative expected real returns at the moment. Long-term investors need a better solution. In the 2021 paper, US Inflation and Global Asset Returns, the authors study the relationship between U.S. inflation and the performance of global assets, including bonds, stocks, industry portfolios, style portfolios like small cap value and large cap value, commodities, and REITs over the period 1927 to 2020, and the 30 years from 1991 to 2020. In their sample, they find that average real returns for most asset classes are lower, but still positive, in times of higher inflation but the differences are not statistically reliable, especially in the more recent sample. Energy stocks and commodities had positive correlations with expected and unexpected inflation in the post-1991 sample, but the volatility of these assets made them poor inflation hedges. The assets returns were about 20 times as volatile as inflation, and despite the positive correlation, more than half of their return variance was unexplained by inflation. If the objective of an inflation hedge is to reduce the uncertainty of real consumption, the high volatility of commodities and energy stocks make them unsuitable despite their positive relationship with inflation. While they do tend to have inflationary boosts to their returns, commodities have low or negative real returns in non-inflationary periods. As demonstrated in the paper, The Best Strategies for Inflationary Times, published in the Journal of Portfolio Management, a huge portion of the historically positive returns for commodities during periods of high inflation has come from energy commodities. The authors suggest caution in interpreting the data since it is likely that in the long term, oil and other brown economy fuels will lose the level of inflation performance they enjoyed in the past. While US small cap value and large cap value style portfolios have had lower returns under high inflation than low, they have still delivered meaningfully positive excess real returns relative to the stock market. The average annual U.S. market return under high inflation from 1927 to 2020 was 4.91%, while the small cap value portfolio returned 11.95% and the large cap value portfolio returned 8.13%. Similar results are obtained in the 1991 to 2020 sample. The data on value stocks and inflation seem really compelling. In the period of 0% real U.S. stock market returns from 1966 to 82, Value stocks delivered a meaningful 6.71% real annualized return. There's even some theory backing this up. In a 2021 paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management titled Value and Interest Rates Are Rates to Blame for Values Torments, the authors explore the theory and evidence. An intuitive theory relating interest rates to value and growth stocks is that growth stocks have expected cash flows further in the future than value stocks, making them more sensitive to changes in interest rates. Under this theory, growth stock prices should fall more than value stocks when rates are rising, all else equal. While this is a compelling narrative, applying a concept for bonds to stocks has some big challenges. Unlike with bonds, cash flows for stocks are uncertain and likely change in response to the same economic conditions that result in interest rates changing. 
The authors find that despite what might appear in some samples to be a relationship between value stocks and interest rates, the economic significance is small and not robust in other samples. True as that may be, the story seems to be playing out again this year. Globally, amid high inflation and rising rates, growth stocks from January to March 2022 had delivered a negative 9.78% return, while value stocks were roughly flat at negative 0.79%. Anecdotes aside, we do know that value stocks have tended to deliver a risk premium independent of the market. More independent risk premiums in a portfolio should result in a more reliable outcome under any conditions. Another independent source of expected returns is international diversification. If one country experiences a period of high inflation, the stock markets of other countries will not necessarily be affected. A 2014 paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management titled Inflation Hedging with International Equities shows that international equities hedge against inflation levels and inflation changes more effectively than domestic equities do. Foreign stocks are still risky assets, and there's limited reason to expect a predictable relationship with domestic unexpected inflation. So again, I would not call international stocks a hedge. But they are an improvement over owning only domestic equities, which we know tend to suffer during bouts of domestic inflation. Coming back to the 1966 through 1982 anecdotal period for a US investor, Canadian and UK stocks delivered a positive real return over the period. Gold has, somehow, managed to gain a reputation as an inflation hedge. Roy Jastram's 1976 book, The Golden Constant, The English and American Experience, 1560 to 1976, documents that gold has been a poor inflation hedge over periods spanning a few years and a good inflation hedge over periods spanning hundreds of years. In the 2013 paper, The Golden Dilemma, Claude Erb and Campbell Harvey again show that gold may be an effective hedge if the investment horizon is measured in centuries, but over practical investment horizons that humans are concerned with, gold is an unreliable inflation hedge, swinging wildly around real prices in the short run. They also find that there has been no historical relationship between gold prices and unexpected inflation and show that any perception of gold's ability to hedge unexpected inflation is driven by a single observation in 1979. In a 2020 paper, Erb, Harvey, and Visconta demonstrate that the real price of gold at the time of their writing was almost as high as it was in January 1980 and August 2011, two instances of heightened inflation expectations. From January 1980 to January 1985, inflation averaged 6.3% per year. The real price of gold fell 65%. From August 2011 to August 2016, inflation averaged 1.2% per year, and the real price of gold fell about 33%. That's not an inflation hedge. In the best strategies for inflationary times, the authors show that momentum performs very well in inflationary times, returning 8% real versus 4% in normal times but they suggest caution in interpreting the data because the difference in returns is not statistically significant and it's extremely sensitive to the start and end dates of the inflationary periods. Momentum crashes followed the end of some of the inflationary periods in their analysis, and of course, we can't predict when a period has ended without the benefit of hindsight. So far this year, funds attempting to capture the momentum premium have not been performing well. Finally, a search for the ultimate inflation hedge would not be complete without mentioning Bitcoin. The idea that Bitcoin should be an inflation hedge stems from its fixed supply. In the monetarist view of the price level, the only thing that matters for inflation is the supply of money. This view is, at best, outdated. The money supply and inflation are not related. As for Bitcoin, while inflation has been rising, Bitcoin is down before accounting for the effects of inflation at nearly 20% year-to-date at the time of recording. That is certainly not an inflation hedge. In the best strategies for inflationary times, the authors show that while theoretically Bitcoin should have a zero inflation beta and a zero market beta, in reality it seems to have a high beta with US stocks. They offer the example of March 2020 when the stock market dropped 34%, gold dropped 12%, and Bitcoin dropped 53%. When markets recovered, the stock market reached an all-time high, gold reached its third highest value in history, and Bitcoin rose more than 800% in the 12 months following its March 2020 trough. This suggests that rather than a safe haven asset, Bitcoin is a speculative asset with a positive beta against the US market. Given the fact that high inflation is negatively related to US equity returns, we probably shouldn't expect Bitcoin to save us from high inflation. 
Expected inflation is built into expected financial asset returns. We generally expect to earn a positive real risk premium for owning stocks and bonds over long periods of time. Expected inflation is not generally a problem. More concerning is unexpected inflation, but the perfect hedge for unexpected inflation is elusive. I think that the best way to deal with inflation, both expected and unexpected, is a properly diversified portfolio with multiple sources of positive expected returns, decreasing the probability of enduring an extended period where all of them fail to pay off. This can be accomplished through low-cost funds diversified across domestic and international markets with a tilt toward independent sources of expected return like value stocks and small cap value stocks. While some assets like commodities, gold, and Bitcoin are often proposed as inflation hedges, their low expected returns, high volatility, and tenuous relationship with unexpected inflation should be enough to deter most sensible investors. Thanks for watching. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information.